Hello everyone, today we talk about Avar and Magyar tactics uh, from the uh, Byzantine military treatises and telling the truth, I should um, underline here that we will be focusing chiefly on the strategic, on the 6th century uh, pseudo Maurice uh, treaty uh, which is fundamentally also the uh, source for the later tactica of the Emperor uh, Leo the Wise dating to uh, either the, the very late 9th or the very beginning of the uh, 10th century uh, that fundamentally literally like pastes and copy what the Strategicon wrote about these peoples. There is an interesting ethnographic um, uh, point to make here because uh, the, the fundamentally the paragraph here we're going to read is the second of the eleventh book of of uh, the Strategicon, right? Uh, yeah, I have just uh, you know English translation um, dealing with the Scythians, that is, Avars, Turks, and others whose way of life resembles that of the Hunnish peoples. So by the late sixth century, when the work was written, uh, lots of interesting things were going on, broadly speaking. Uh, in the northern frontier of the empire, that was not uh, like the, the most important, but definitely, you know, like it, it uh, rivaled w with the eastern one. Uh, the Balkan frontier was quite uh, unstable. Movements of the migration era was not over, right? And especially in this, you know, uh, uh, southeastern European reality opened eventually to, to the steppes north of the Black Sea that were always regurgitating these new uh, populations. And in fact, that's fundamentally what will occur, uh, had already occurred, whether we have seen with leaving aside the Germans, etc., but looking at specifically these nomadic peoples that eventually settled and maintaining in part for, for some time their uh, traditional way of life in the Pannonian Plain, because that's essentially the westernmost um, step uh, of Eurasia and closer to the you know rich Western European areas that they, they would loot and you know invade. And so what had basically happened had been the establishment of the Huns, uh, of the Avars, later of these times in uh, of the Magyars, right? Uh, there would be another group to include here that are the Bulgars, that at, uh, in Maurice's time were not already there, if not uh, by, you know, in small numbers, because frankly, to even, as we will see, uh, the, same, the same Roman sources tell us, you know, it doesn't make any sense to distinguish sharply, categorically, like right? the, these peoples were properly uh, glued together, coming from, from the most diverse backgrounds, right? You know, the Avars are meant to be prevalently Turkic. Um, the uh, the Bulgars kind of a mix between Turkic and Indo-European, um, because, you see, the, by late, uh, the, during migration here, it's the moment in which the, um, the Indo-European Eurasian steppes is, is largely overrun by Turkic Mongolian elements, right? And they, they, they lose the, hand, the upper hand, but fundamentally these peoples had not disappeared. Yes, in part they had settled in the West. Uh, this is a process that was mediated by the same Romans, right? Think about the Sarmatians, uh, you know, as auxiliaries settled here, you know, as far as Britain, etc. And all the important uh, military uh, cultural impact that this had in, uh, on Europe, also in the reviving of this, uh, in fact, steps, culture, since the times of the uh, Proto-Indo-European invasion of Europe, um, and um, in and also, in, as we've seen, in gestation of properly of medieval knighthood, right? And today we don't we won't digress on that, but it's important to to see how you know. Mm, even in relatively short time, an important amount of people could could literally move and or blend in together with others. The Magyars are not properly are, are not Turk. They, they were uh, Ugro Finnic, so also they're a bit of an exception in this picture. But they had surely partly blended together with the Turks, and part of the reason being that in, in the steppes there is no barrier in, in a sense. I mean, there are many actually, but the way properly these communities uh, uh, dwell and, uh, you know, operate as, is a continuous blending, a continuous uh, composition, decomposition of, 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 of broad com political group of confederacies of different peoples that are properly also ethnically different. This is to be seen also in, you know, even in Europe, in semi-nomadic realities, when you see 
Germanic confederacies, well, from their own perspective, um, they, they were still a group of different tribes that retained, even within the confederacy, a separate identity. And the reason being is that, of course, this lifestyle was terrible. Right, uh, this step is not the wasteland as we imagine it. There are many, you know, there are there are resources. Uh, it's just they're not the typical ones of the sedentary world. There are also sedentary communities actually in the steppes, and these peoples are not literally just um, uh, ho on horseback. Literally, albeit you know the strategic and will provide as you know an interesting uh, exaggeration about it, but that will explain. That is still fitting, after all, um, and uh, for for which material culture in this uh, enormous uh, region that uh, you know stretches literally from you know from from uh, Vienna to Vladivostok, we'd say, um, are um, you know are very it's very similar. Like these peoples fundamentally have very similar needs. They they fight essentially in the same ways, right? Uh, steps military cultures, as we already had the opportunity to see, varied over time. There was an improvement. There were, you know, there were there was the development of different tactics of different techniques, technologies. Uh, things changed in the step over the centuries, the millennium, right? But here we're talking fundamentally at this time span of late sixth, beginning of the tenth century, where, as you can imagine, not much essentially changed, right? In a pre-industrial society in general, not just in, in the steppe, but even in the same Roman Empire. So as you know, the strategic, and we already made uh, two videos of this kind, uh, dealing with the so-called blonde-haired peoples that are meant to represent the, roughly the, the Germanic ones at this time, and uh, truthfully the Longbirds, the Franks, the, the peoples like these. Um, we made one about the Slavs and the Antes. Um, those that were altogether Slavic peoples, um, and um, and as you know, the here the the author is fundamentally describing, with a bit of proper ethnographical taste, as was you know famous in Roman tradition, but for the purpose of a, of a, essentially a strategical uh, need of how to cope with these populations, both um, in fact strategically and tactically, and in fact suggesting also what were what. The, the best uh, formations, tactical modules, essentially, would be to cope uh, with these guys on the field. These were all conceived as uh, enemies of the Romans uh, by a certain degree. Uh, as you know, the, the, by the 6th century, the Roman Empire was fundamentally at the peak of its uh, ethnographical, you know, intellectual, su superior... Um, and uh, diplomatic skilled uh, culture, right, compared to the surrounding peoples. It was a moment, as you know, you know, the, the, of expansion from one side, but still important crisis shortly afterwards, also since Maurice's times, um, where the the empire was literally under siege right, from different directions, from these multitude of peoples of very different ethnic background that in fact retain all they, they had also a lot in common by certain standards especially a question warfare was a big deal not just here which is the 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 extreme case because these were basically only just all, virtually all cavalry um uh, armies uh in you know we're talking about the, the turkoi as the 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 Romans call them now, um, with this, however, degree of approximation as we have seen, uh, but also naturally differing, and these were all peoples that, in a way or another, served in the Roman army as well. Right, the sixth century sees a, a, an abundant, more than abundant employment of uh, of mercenaries, but properly also of um, you know, political mediation for which uh, the empire had to send these guys against one another uh, and to cope with them properly also, in fact, from a diplomatical point of view. So everything had to be known. The strategic was a courtly work, right? We, we call it the Saudo Maurice because uh, it was attributed to Maurice uh, as um, he was uh, emperor at the time, but, uh, you know, th this is a condensation of broader knowledge that uh, circulated at the court among the uh, the, the imperial family, the, the, the generals, the, you know, the men that, generally speaking, were interested in these things for, for, for the sake of a practical purpose, right? When you read Leo uh, the Wise's tactic, aside from realizing the 
properly the copy of the, the literal copy of, of, of these parts of the text to the work, you see already, you know, how Byzantine culture had changed by that point into something a bit more uh, still clever, but a bit more sclerotized, or at least, um, you know, much more traditionalist that looked mostly at the repetition of tradition as a concrete. Um, you know, uh, as, as mostly a piece of literature. We we made a video, for example, drawn heavily from Leo de Weiss' Tactica regarding two uh, Byzantine naval tactics, I think, during the early Middle Ages, where you realize that um, there were certain topoi and other things that were written not because they, they made much of a military sense, but they were maybe considered, you know, uh, dialectically or rhetorically expedient in some way. Um, the 6th century work is said it, it, it's very fresh, right? When you read it, you can understand that brilliant um, Hellenic uh, modern intellectual mindset, co you know, coupled with properly Roman pragmatism, concreteness, you know, and um, positivity. So um, the best in many ways of what we call Byzantine civilization. Um, I was, I, I wasn't Oh, uh, done with, with the Bulgars because these would fit actually in the group that we were talking about today. Uh, but Leo the Wise fundamentally um, uh, says that they were virtually uh, you know, almost complete, almost identical to the uh, to the, Ma to the Turks pr practically. That as we've seen at, at the time meant the Magyars that had ousted the, the hours after the Charlemagne had crushed them, and that, however, since the Bulgars at that point had already been, uh, you know, they, they had been Christianized, Romanized, etc., uh, the emperor writes, you know, that they're looking more, becoming more similar to us, to the Romans, and this is definitely true, because the Bulgars settled very close, properly to, to Constantinople, they had, they started building properly a parallel church, they almost from their side, they ideally shared the, the the empire with the Romans, right? Whereas the Romans thought that basically they were just an emanation of their own. Um, this is another thing, but let's say this video could fit also for the early Bulgars in the way the Byzantines called them. So, it, also to make long story short, when you we talk about the Turks here, it's um it's an uh, ethnographic uh, stereotype uh, approximation, and there is much of classicism in even in, in other. Um, denominations. The 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 here is probably also the difference between the Avars and the Turks and other similar people. The source says because they they all look similar to the Huns that was they were presumably the you know the ideal mo here the Huns were still around by the way right the, the were we know there were Hunnic mercenaries etc yeah Attila's times were over from from a long time but still these peoples roamed around their remains and. Uh, these strategic groups them all under the name of the Scythians, right? What does it mean? The Scythians were the Indo-Iranian uh, people, fundamentally, that, you know, dwelled in the uh, north of the Black Sea in classical antiquity. And it, here, the, the Byzantines were a bit, being already a bit classicistic to say, okay, since they, more or less, they, that, that was the land inhabited by the Scythians, this is if, you know, whoever lived in there was still a Scythian, right? But as you see here, from the title itself, they managed to distinguish still in our Turks, etc., that had nothing to do um, with uh, with the Scythians, uh, the original ones, at least. And surely there was a remain of Scythians there as well. As we've seen, this was a bit of a, you know, et dramatic ethnic cauldron. But what really makes them similar is that they were, according to the source, a bit sim or similar in, in warfare, and that by approximation, they could be called uh, like this. Um, so I will just read the text and comment in it in the meanwhile. It's not very long. I repeat it. It's, it, it's book 11, uh, paragraph 2. There are references to... There are small references to these peoples uh, in the rest of the work, but they are basically referring to things that, you know, are also written in here. There are references also to other parts of the work that I've read before so that I can address you to um, that are also however very simple and uh, have to do with how the, the baggage train of the Roman army had to be arranged when facing these peoples and how so what, what kind of uh, 
property of battle formation that we have to, to enable. And the fact, last thing before we start, that uh, layout device mm, copied completely a uh, strategic passage about the, the others uh, for describing the hungers is in itself, as we've seen, a bit of a classicistic attitude, but it's still realistic in the you know, in the essentials, as we've seen. Uh, Avars and Hungers probably had, you know, some differences that we'll see more in detail in dedicated videos as the, we, we make um, in detail for, for every single one, and typologies of fire and so on. Um, but, because they were diff in different time, if anything, with different background. Uh, but in the essentials, yes, they basically were the same like it, it's accurate to uh, after all with the degree of natural degree of approximation the hover is very safe you know the, the the work is, is accurate the description is, is not as realistic um you know can be accepted bro broadly meant and yes i think these works are very uh are correct right they sometimes say something that we we can't take like as literal um or uh, absolutely saying, you know, since the strategic and wrote it, it was like that and just like that. Here, the the Byzantine thought also a bit in in its uh, Hellenic legacy was tending to already kind of sclerotize certain categorical, you know, groups slash interpretations, so that you know, it it sounds too too theoretical to be in fact practical, right? And we know from the art of war that you know every army is different there's never been historically a single army that has been uh, equal to another I'm not talking about different peoples properly the single armies within the same peoples and the same institutions even in, in statal um, communities with a, an important degree of, of homogeneity there is no such thing historically and not even in today's times uh, it's always changing so it's obviously you know we, we can't but but still we have to appreciate the you know the effort of of synthesis that has been done in this work, because at the end of the day, things that are written are are accurate, right? And uh, both for Maurice and uh, Leo's times, right? So let's simply read it. Um, all right. So to dealing with the Scythians, that is, Avars, Turks, and others, whose way of life resembles that of the Hunnish resembles also so it's interesting that already there is not a complete equation right it's just that the Huns had been the preval prevalent model of the you know the bounded people of the steppe that came bordering you know <laughs> um, from the Balkans and so and so on so um, uh, it says the, the Scythian nations are one so to speak in their mode of life and in their organization which is primitive and includes many peoples so actually this is a brilliant synthesis right because they the source is stating exactly what more or less we know exactly from these peoples that they were very similar in lifestyle in the way they were organized politically and socially it was a primitive uh, reality right because the the step leaves with much less resources than you know the sedentary world um, and there is this properly multicultural, this, this idea that, that it, there's not just one people, right? And that, in fact, these are called, you see, in the title, Scythians, then eventually uh, in the text, Scythian nations, to stress the fact that these were different stocks, right? They include many different peoples as such. Mm -hmm. Consider that the Roman perspective here is habituated to evaluate mostly on, yes, and what for the Romans was the natio, right? Properly the idea of, you know, coming from something, you know, li like a, a a regional scale level of, of um, you know, of ethnic, all, you know, approximately shared characteristics um, at largest. All right, so the Eurasian steps definitely provided lots of, of these variations, and yeah, the, the text is correct in pointing it out. Um, then, it goes on and says, of these peoples, only the Turks and the others concern themselves with military organization. And this makes them stronger than the other Scythian nations when it comes to pitched battles. 
Now, I'm sure there, there, are, there are a lot of ethnographic studies on properly what the strategic means by the Turks, uh, as well as other peoples, etc. Here, as far as I understand, uh, the, the main division goes by this. Like, the, the Turks were, well, the Romans were aware that the, the ethnic, um, you know, the, the prevalent, at least the, the, the most powerful at that point in history, ethnic component was pushing westwards, right? from Central Asia. And and the Avars are distinguished by them simply because, I presume, they had settled in the Pannonian Plain at this point and were that major power that uh, was actually, you know, um, growing as, as such, right, becoming more cohesive. When the, Avar, the Avars settled different tracks, right, they weren't, there is a bit, they, we have seen it in the videos on Longobard history, that there's a bit this idea that the Avars, it's, it's very mechanistic, war gameistic, that the Avars were just strong because they had, you know, they had this ultra-heavily armored elite and, you know, a hell of a, indeed, of Zoltagmic, you know, metallurgic cap capabilities were definitely a fierce military machine. But as Clausewitzians, we perfectly know that a military system is effective only when it comes from a cohesive political and social reality. The Avars at the moment of their settlement were not, right? It would take a generation um, or two before they basically started to move as one, with a, as a major cognate that was eventually able to, to, in fact, put also Constantinople under siege, launching raids into Merovingian Germany, uh, making, you know, you know, being a, con a consistent power and definitely a hell of a military machine, right? The, the, the Romans thought highly of of these people's um warfare right and they they were very cautious uh, against it so the turks are a bit uh, basically the same with the others as we've seen because these peoples were similar as the source says um and the fact that others in this scythian group are excluded possibly refers to the fact that the romans were acknowledging the the sunset of uh of the Iranian, um, you know, prevalence in the steppe, right? The Sarmatians at this point had fundamentally uh, melted away um, and crumpled as the main people in north of the Black Sea. So um, there were lots of, of these other groups that were also not very easily distinguishable um, for them, right? For, for us, it's uh, much a greater challenge, but also at the time, don't think that, you know, it was so evident, right, what, what existed, like, uh, up to, especially in these areas. It wasn't much a matter of distance, but properly of the, the means of information regarding to who was who, and as we've seen, it was very tricky among these peoples because they, they, they changed often. They, they split, they regrouped, and uh, it was surely difficult to follow, uh, even at that time, historically speaking. And uh, th this source states fundamentally that this Turkic elements had probably a better military. On average, right? We don't have to suppose here military organization. I don't know what, what the corresponding Greek uh, term is, but it's probably more, you know, in fact, open to 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 interpretation. This is a matter of organization, you know, in terms of organics, you know, the military are. This is this means properly military effectiveness, right? Cohesion, right? That this is how they properly interpret it. Yet. Um, and the source says, and this makes them stronger, okay, we've we seen that the other Scythian nations, when it comes to pitched battles, right? So th this is actually very important because it is true, right? The, the more advanced civilization is and, and the more, the, the better chance it stands properly in pitched battles because its military is properly better uh, organized, also logistically, also, you know, as, as a broader, it's broadly more fit. To, to engage and properly bring in the, all those forces, managing to keep them together on the field, which for these peoples is not to be given for granted, definitely. So cohesion here, political cohesion, first and foremost, is the key for that. The source says then, the nation of the Turks is very numerous and independent. Hmm? So it is true, uh, and, uh, you know, they, by numerous, definitely, that referring to demographic strength, independent because it fundamentally wasn't subject to anybody, right? They didn't have any major overlord altogether in, in the step. And they regarded properly independence as a value. Mm -hmm. And the source says, they are not versatile or skilled in most human endeavors, mm -hmm. 
nor have they trained themselves for anything else except to conduct themselves bravely against their enemies. It's a very interesting ethnographic bias when it says, you know, they're not versatile or skilled in most human endeavors. That is to say, you know, what properly these peoples were considered as humane, right, in... Uh, you see, this is a, a, a stereotype the, the Greeks retained since uh, classical times about the Scythians, right? That they were, they were properly designed as, as the world upside down. What the, these barbarians were in opposition to civilization because, I don't know, they had things like, you know, um, warrior maidens or they, they lived on you know, horseback and they, they had, you know, what the, the Elaine thought were being strange practice and ferocious ones, etc. Naturally, uh, uh, you know, here... The, the legacy continues uh, historiographically. Um, and nor they have trained themselves for anything else except to conduct themselves bravely against their enemies. So uh, they're very warlike, right? They, they're, wo they're warlike people. Their entire population, male population at least, is, is devoted to, to war, but properly the entire people are functional to that kind of lifestyle in the sense that uh, they have always to be on the move, right? The herds, the, the cows, so they, they bring also families together. At least, you know, they also launch expeditions just with what we call military. But there is not a distinction between the people properly and its army, right? Uh, the source says the others, and, so, and they also have to show this bravery. And this is something we know for many other peoples, also later on coming from Central Asia. These are things we know very well, you know, from for Seljuk military culture. Lots of, you know, um, of these essentially Turkic military traditions that even in their warfare sometimes show something almost suicidal in terms of fanatic bravery when it gets to, you know, for example, having to prove their, the courage of the young elements they had to to go almost wrestling on horseback with their opponents, pulling their horses' tails as a form of, you know, of insult and bravery and still, you know, coming close to this uh, elite, but, you know, unarmored. They, so they did things to, to prove that fundamentally they had to be up to the task. Um, here it, it's valid what we've seen countless times, but more in detail, if anything, by, by an amount of videos, uh, for, think about even the Germanic commentators, etc. There were very different lifestyles in, in materially, right? But the, the idea of courage to be proven as fundamentally something that goes beyond any significance of the individual, right, um, is... is is it deeply ingrained and imbued in, in, in these populations, right? The, the, if you are not fit for war, you're not a human being, right? You, you're, you're worthless. You will be a slave. You will be killed because you're, you don't have any... Like, the deity of the sky doesn't provide you with any value for that society because that society, because of the scarcity of resources and the, the constant threat of, you know, of the instability, etc., has to rely exclusively fundamentally in a military uh, capacity to survive right and if you're not good for that you're basically socially and politically useless and therefore you're nothing also in terms of freedom of, of rights of, of how these peoples completely orally you know organize their own their own society that in many ways was a mess right uh, it was uh, that, 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 that was not properly a central control it was not you know everything was taken you know, but it was in the hands of the clients, etc. So uh, these were fundamentally a bunch of, you know, mobsters, overlords that, uh, ter you know, tyrannically disposed of, of their subjects, etc. on the base of, uh, exclusively on the base of force. And this is something that um, the source uh, here will will also point out at some point. Uh, then the source says, the others, for their part, are scoundrels, devious, and very experienced in military matters, right? So here, I don't know whether the text is really adversative, uh, if the proposition is adversative, but uh, it doesn't sound eventually much uh, as a, you know, um, you know, as as if the others were particularly different from the rest of these Turks. Um, it's it's just being closer to to the Romans, you know, they are better considered for the practicality of what this manual was supposed to be, that is, to, to fight against it, you know, the close enemies of the empire. And this idea that there were 
squander the devious they, they were treacherous right they they didn't maintain their board etc they also were experienced in military matters it reflects a broader you know a, a different cultural background definitely that um, it's difficult to explain anthropologically but that could go by saying that um this this policies were so unstable and properly they didn't know that kind of permanent uh, sedentary need of a you know a, a broader let's say um um territorialized uh, control that fundamentally the idea of even caring so much about the um not about the oaths themselves but let's say that these communities were so unstable that you couldn't properly even expect by the, their background that they would even care about about you right they were just thinking about saving their own skins this should be always considered however in fact that still the mills for client tales these systems were based on were still founded on a very fanatic sense of loyalty right as far as the elites were concerned right but there were these worms literally oceans of of lighter troopers that were fundamentally from the subject populations that were already you know in fact defeated and trying to you know to to emancipate themselves and they were they were poor because they basically were just provided these swarms of horse archers but they didn't have the, the shock uh, element of the ultra heavy elite right and they, they properly had a different purpose so it would seem to these external observers as if you know this huge movements of people so by themselves that at the end of the day made the bulk the numerical bulk of 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 of, uh, of the armies as well um reflected this kind of treacherous behavior right but still they had possible also exactly for this reason a very high military average right because they were so much used to to danger uh, to instability that they, they had just to leave like that which is definitely very different from from sedentary systems they are trying to answer more mechanically to um to threats right in a premeditated way these people's just properly according to me they didn't even distinguish like properly didn't even understand what the ways of life the sedentary world was eventually they 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 sedentarized you see a population like the hunts would never be able to con to govern a, a sedentary civilization right simply they they lacked the the the, the, the cultural tools right what happens with the avars with the magyars is eventually they sedentarized uh, among uh, you know a pool of you know a much larger demographic pool of sedentary people so already inhabited there and it was also the bulgars and so on and um, and so things progressed but even in there not terrific civilization emerged also because they you know th this were areas were that were properly exposed to the same nomadic populations and that that is something to be felt uh, in a world also for the you know healthy and long lasting proceeding of you know and survival of a, of a sedentary uh, society right so things as you know in these wars took a bit more to take off compared to other areas of europe um the um the source says these nations have a monarchical form of government yes they had the the kans and the kagans so the the kings and their over uh, over kings um their rulers subject them to cruel punishments for their mistakes yes they that that inflexibility we've seen before that from especially from the elite would bring to yes they they had so many subjects that every once in a while they had to make an example and they wouldn't absolutely have any scruple to exterminate an enormous amount of people just for for example which believe it or not is uh, in those in those contexts you know a, a value of civilization because they they you know not doing that would would equate maybe to way more people dying by you know the the system splitting and being overrun by others so it, it's it's as cruel and sick as it sounds but it's also purposeful never think that here there is some cultural evil it, they were doing it properly f yes they also inherited this as you know part of their morals they of course didn't give a damn about human life whatsoever but they um they um you know they evaluated it on, on on a pragmatic base they, they didn't do it because you know for the ta taste of, of evil at all so no. here we're Clausewitzians, not culturalists right you know I, i'm sure there is a 
a, a thunder somewhere every, every time I, I, I pronounce culturalism. Bro. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, gover- the, the source goes on and says, uh, governed not by love, but by fear, the Terrans, they steadfastly bear labors and hardships. Right? So they know how their world goes. They live in this very hard ways, uh, their lifestyles that definitely intense from a psychophysical point of view. They struggle hard for survival, for resources. Uh, the, the, their surplus is ridiculous. So either they succeed or they, they starve to death, right? Or they are exterminated by somebody else. Uh, then, in fact, uh, the, the source says they endure heat and cold in the steps you have considerable excursions of that um, and, and the want of many necessities since they are nomadic peoples mm-hmm. so they are habituated to it. they are very superstitious treacherous fool faithless so you see here it's talking about these nations altogether it's not just about the others possessed by an insatiate desire for riches right so what does a roman source mean by this. Well, superstition here is something you can find easily, I don't know. When Tacitus speaks of the Germans, that they, they rolled it, they looked at how sticks um, you know, they, they basically rolled the dice to, to, to see whether they, they should attack or not. It's because uh, the, the, the level of risk was so high in these societies that when there was a, a disagreement, the most intelligent way to surpass it was literally to roll the dice. Right to make it random because, um, and to to make this practice uh, politically and socially not just acceptable but properly legitimating, because they believed that naturally this decision came from 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 the gods that had made things gone uh, lean from from in favor of that option. Um, so they, they these peoples were deeply attached to this way of you know strategy making. Right, because they were aware there was no easy way out. So, um, properly, as we know, as Clausewitz and counterbalance, pretending to count the risk scientifically, pos- positivistically, is, is is nonsense by any scientific standard. And these people had not rationalized it, but surely they they had made work their societies along that pattern because otherwise they would have died. Um, and therefore, they were probably very attached to these, uh, you know, symbols, signs, things that you know. In the Byzantine world, by this time, you know, it was definitely a more secularized mindset compared to the steppes. These people, believe, were still uh, basically at an animistic level. They had they they properly saw the world as you know animated by magic spheres of forces of in mean, every you know in single objects and wherever they went. So they were very high, hyper cautious uh, and almost paranoid at a certain level, but. Because experience had taught them they had to stay sharp all the time. Uh, for the same reason, they, they could also turn easily uh, against, you know, the pacts, as we've seen, a treacherous, fool, faithless. Also possessed by an insatiate desire for riches. Because that's what nomads have always done. They won't go pillaging for the places that are rich because they are fundamentally from the weaker side of the island. The best thing they can hope for is to, you know, make this hit and runs and to, you know, loot enough to coming back to a step and trying to centralize on, on the base of that booty that will be shared to, to fuel the clientels um, and uh, growing more powerful for a while, right? And repeating this over again and, and sometimes also failing and everything collapsing at that point and reform is shifting balance of power in another tribe, another people, and, and on and on and on, right? It's basically the same old story. So obviously these guys dream of the rich, uh, lands of the Mediterranean, of the Middle East. Uh, in fact, they're harassing these areas as well. Um, the source says, they scorn their oath, do not observe agreements. We have just seen it, basically, and are not satisfied by gifts. Right? This thing that people are fundamentally greedy. Right? Once they get a gift that is already a tribute, remember mobsters, hush money, that's basically the same thing. Once they see a people pays them, they want more, right? They're, they're always asking for more. And even, uh, the source says, even before they accept the gift, they are making plans for treachery and betrayal of their agreements. 
which from a strategical point of view makes a lot of sense because if things go wrong you have to have a, a B plan right this is exactly what I don't know in Western Europe the, the Germans thought of the Byzantine systems <laughs> you know and vice versa for that matter so it's always the same old story but in particular um, you know the again that level of instability we were describing before would mirror culturally this constant unreliability from the political, military, strategical, diplomatic perspective that here the, the Romans are writing uh, about them about. And the source says they are clever at estimating suitable opportunities hmm, to do this and taking prompt advantage of them as well, because as we've seen, they have to act fast, right? They don't have the resources to create an overruling empire that will, you know, deeply control territorially everything. They, they're, as we've seen, their force, the world is based on deterrence more than an, an, an actually ter uh, sedentarized power. So uh, they, they, they also are uh, their their war economy is largely based on loot. So they have to know where to strike uh, quick without the enemy, you know, per, you know, taking the enemy by surprise. Um, so this is recognized. The source says they prefer to prevail over their enemies not so much by force as by deceit. Mm -hmm. Surprise attacks and cutting off supplies. So in other ways, you know, this is the general purpose of war altogether, right? You don't need to, you know, spend force when you can, you know, simply wipe out the enemy in, in, the, in, other, in other ways. Uh, but they... Are pro these people are probably making more economy than others on that on that level, right? And they they are much more functionalized in that in that sense. Uh, yeah. So the seeds, surprise attacks, cutting off supplies also is interesting. Considered as we will see that they 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 usually did not just strategically but probably also from a tactical point of view, and with their speedy and you know numerous uh, light cavalry, they could really carry out effectively a scorched earth strategy, right? To wear out more powerful enemies. Um, the source says they are armed with male swords, bows, and lances. Yes, this is basically it, right? Basically every people at this point is equipped like this, but more so, as, as we will see now, all, all these elements together, right? In, especially in combined arms tactics are perfectly functionalized. The source says, in combat, most of them attack doubly armed, in fact. Lances slung over their shoulders and holding bows in their hands. They make use of both as requires. This is very interesting for a number of reasons that we will see, especially in the in-depth videos on specifically Abar and Magyar warfare, but these peoples were very, um, uh, you know, this, this you see, uh, Normally speaking, if, if you take Persia, for example, you know, or say Romans, uh, heavy and light cavalry, or at least you know, shock and missile cavalry were dis uh, were properly separated from a tactical point of view, right? Um, they in in different units, right? But the the peoples of the steppes, the, the most hardcore ones, were still capable of coupling the, the same thing in a single. Um, properly in a single trooper. The reason being that uh, n not not that they lacked um, collective um, training, right? In a uh, properly from a military point of view, but the fact is that as we've seen, they were all different clans together, so they generally distrusted each other. They might have had a common political motive make them cohesive, as we've seen seizing these opportunities and so on. But on the field. It's as if that paranoid mentality maintained them fundamentally still, you know, a bit more independent, therefore needing to be also individually more reliable, right, to their section of the line, such for being made of the same clansmen, having this need of functionalizing for, for each trooper as much as they could, also in individual training, right? So these peoples had a very high individual training as well, um, that uh, on the base of which they, it was... Uh, in the sense, the, the lack of a broader form of uniformity in the army organization proper, right? Because as as we will see, they would their their tactics were fairly simple, 
right, as effective, and that was also process, you know part of their functionality. Sedentary civilizations would would reason more in a more advanced way because they had the means to properly and rationally and logically, from a military point of view, separate different units to maximize combined tactics on a larger scale. These guys instead retained them a, a bit more into. But but with a level of an individual training that that was lost in most areas, um, and uh, still this this is important to stress is that you know this combination of you know shock cavalry with lance plus bows still uh, was something you find for example in uh, in the top uh, Iranian nations in some centuries before. Right, eventually diluted on, but even the partings initially were like that, then eventually separated more. But they they revealed surely a, a very high military practice, and also probably some contact still with the Middle East and um, and the the steps immediately north of them. But this is seen by lots of things, uh, including uh, properly, you know, from archaeological connections, we know it was the case. Um, Avars, Magyars, but also medieval Hungary would maintain uh, through the Danubian Valley, the Black Sea, the Ka- you know, etc., very strong contacts with the Middle East. Um, Avars, famously enough, were uh, were the ones credited with the introduction in Europe with the Chinese um, um, trebuchet, right? Uh, that uh, also provided them not just through that, but also eventually with the subjugation of the populations that the of where they settled this siege warfare capabilities. So here the source is actually talking about, as we've seen, mostly these nomadic peoples as such. It's not making the case for eventually how they, once they settled in the Pannonian Plain, how they transformed themselves, which did happen. Right in our warfare, for example, the Slavic contribution was very important as mostly infantry based. Not only, but um, still, you know, something that normally in the steps w- was wasn't quite there, uh, and that these um, peoples managed to combine all together. So we will see that again in in very different videos. So here, bear in mind, we're just commenting a, a very concise text that is meant to be so, but that is still correct in the overall generalization of this broader steps people's warfare right which is very spot on after all um uh, yeah so here it literally says that they they shot with their bows before charge right um in order they could alternate the thing but still it was it was a real thing so not only do they wear the source says armor themselves but in addition the horses of their illustrious men are covered in front with iron or felt mm-hmm. so this is um what we were saying before the elite was ultra armored including uh armor for their horses um and uh it's rare right it's extremely expansive these were just the chieftains and their retinues and as we've seen, the majority of the people would be instead, you know, fundamentally horse archers, with some kind of also, as we've seen, spear capability, because uh, this costume was spread not just in the ultra-heavily uh, trained uh, elite uh, cavalry men, but also, like, in guys that literally didn't have any armor, if not some, you know, felt or leather, things like that, and that were both archers and spearmen at the same time, right? It was very convenient for them, especially considered that they lived on horseback. Right, and um, and here the 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 text asks you know, they they give special attention to training in archery on horseback because that for them was the most important thing. Why? Because well, as we've seen, um, given that the majority of their cavalry was unarmored, um, they would preferably not close in to enemies, especially the ones of the the sedentary peoples that were on average better equipped uh, in infantry. It said that they had some some edge of, against unarmored cavalry in general so for them it was better to uh, specialize in in archery and as we know they were a hell of good archers and the same byzantine military culture drew massively but i mean massively from this you know from from this archery traditions um and and the ob- objective naturally was creating this overwhelming hail of arrows that would soften up the enemy lines uh, the only handicap is that, as we will see also in the tactical part, they they had a few heavily, uh, a few heavy cavalry. So this is the problem with all these peoples we've seen everywhere, up to Seljuk times, etc. 
yeah, they harass you. They, they literally, it's not even about properly the damage of archery, but this, uh, f from a physical point of view, properly the nerve, you know, your nerves are being constantly for an entire day under the sun in armor, etc. Thirds, etc. Uh, harassed con constantly by these guys that you can't even see because, you know, of all the dust, they, they rise, you know, they, they arrive at swarms from here and there, alternating things for a whole freaking day under arrow fire. You, you become, you go nuts, right? And, and that's what they, they, they were systematized to, to produce. It was a horrifying experience. And the, the hope was that, you know, for them, that at the end of the day, they, you would be so exhausted that your, their, their few heavy, uh, shock cavalry would manage to wipe you out, but also military systems were very symmetric by this time, right? They just they were very diff they could be very different, the ones especially between nomadic and sedentary peoples. But at the end of the day, they matched themselves, and in general, uh, broadly meant as we've seen the the sedentary world had an edge on them, right? They uh, status, like they, they, they had produced better response. That is, Roman warfare as, was maintaining as the, the the highest military standard at the time. Um, so the 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 reason why there was this edge was the same reason why these people lived in the steppes and not you know in in richer places because even if they had had this dramatic capacity, they would have settled immediately after overrunning much greater civilization. That didn't happen. So. That, at a political level, social level, reflect also the military one. And it is very important to bear in mind. Not that, you know, these peoples ever completely failed, but eventually they, they, they also went, I don't know, the Achaemenid Empire was born like that. Literally, there were a Scythian uh, group that, you know, invaded, the, you know, the, and uh, the Syrians. And the um, as they had been doing since, you know, centuries, but coming back to the steppe at some point, well... But eventually changing and sedentarizing and changing in nature and becoming something more advanced when sedentarized, right? So obviously the political combinations are infinite, but the average speaks still for a general limit of, of a step people um, possibilities. Then uh, the source says a vast herd of male and female horses follows them both to provide nourishment and to give the impression of a huge arm. They need them, right? And plus they make numbers, so it's difficult to understand, even by explorers, that w was, what's that cavalry for? Are they just, you know, cattle or they or war horses, whatever. So, uh, they do not encamp within entrenchments, this is important, as do the Persians and the Romans, that are civilizations, as we've seen. But until the day of battle, spread about according to tribes and clans, you see, they, they don't have properly a, um, a, an, in, an internal discipline. They go by tribes and clans. They continuously graze their horses, both summer and winter. Uh, this part is very important for a number of reasons that eventually the same uh, work uh, comments on. That is to say, um, they... As we've seen, they, they go by tribes and clans, so they, they properly are scattered altogether. They properly, for the dynamics that bring them together to, to be there on campaign, and are also uh, distrust of each other, right? They don't need to be all in a single camp. They, 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 they feel also for their own security, their mobility. It's better to spread around, right? It's better to uh, also enlarge the area encampment. Because this is needed, first of all, for gra for for the for grazing for logistical reasons. Horses eat a freaking amount of stuff every single day. It's something insane how much a horse eats and drinks every day. And you need a, a very extended surface in order for for that, you know, for properly feeding a horse satisfactorily. And and also, you have to move it the next day because you know the 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 the, the grass is as you know. Uh, it's not, you know, is being eaten. Um, so this is properly a need. Uh, it's useless at that point to be encircled in a fence, in a camp, right? Um, so it's better to, to be like that. And they they also properly, they, they don't know much about, you know, fortification uh, science in, in general, right? The peoples of the Seps are normally considered um, even, I don't know, 
the Romans mocked the Parthians even after centuries of their after their sedentarization because the steppe peoples they hadn't you know, still learned how to be effective with siege warfare. Um, they probably don't need them because in the steppes there is no such thing, and it's still you know the, the ratios of force even you know in the sedentary world after all are not based on how many walls you can erect, but fundamentally how much you can control them and what, what what's in the mind what the guys will have to do it. Um, so it's not important in that context, and the steppes peoples mostly would operate in ways that would make them, you know, strategically functional also in this sense. Of these, um, mostly their, their, the, the, the number of their horses is the discriminant there. You, you can't, the, the, given the numbers of them, we're talking about sometimes even tens of thousands, you, you, uh, you simply, especially in the dry season, there, there are s- certain obliged paths uh, along certain rivers, along certain basins of war, because certain valleys, because uh, if you move away from that, you 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 kill all of, all of your mounts in a few days, even men, but for that matter. Um, even if these men in, in horse breeds are also very resistant, sometimes men drank their their horses' blood, not just as a you know ritual practice, but properly to uh, not to die of thirst. Sometimes in crossing some desert things, you know, um, and. Um, yeah, so this is interesting because from a strategic point of view, the fact the source says that uh, this happens until the day of battle, that is to say, until before the day of battle, they are scattered that way. That that can be confusing for a sedentary military culture that is basically just about the fixed army concentrated only in one place in a camp that you can't see, that you can't face with the enemy, etc. And uh, No, with the, these guys are scattered all over. You, they are difficult in, to understand in intentions. They're dramatically quick at you know putting things together. So you have to stay sharp, as we'll see better now. Then the source says, they then take the horses they think necessary, hobbling them next to their tents, and guard them until it is time to form their battle line, right? So they keep mostly the the uh, naturally here. I presume he's talking properly about war horses, those they will mount themselves for combat, while the others, as we've seen, are also needed for broader um, supply and logistical needs. They keep them close to their own tents where they sleep as the um, before battle, and and uh, they um, they form the battle line usually under the cover of night. So adding an extra uh, level of, uh, you know, unpredictability because uh, you basically can't uh, realize what, what's going on. Everything was done in the science, or at least as much as they could. Um, and it was evidently a, a you know, similar practice. We, we can't imagine how their cultures would have also connected this with, you know, certain, conne- you know, uh, religious connections, rituals, etc. They, the other peoples did as well. Right? Think about the Morning Star. You know the the you know all the the meanings attached, and they lived properly with their minds at, in, in this rea- in this um, a spiritual dimension. The source says they stationed their sentries at some distance, keeping them in contact with one another, so that it's not easy to catch them by a surprise attack. Right? Because yes, they can be scattered as we've seen and the, that that adds some vulnerability to the wall if, if there is a concentrated force that takes them out in detail but they they prepare um this uh sentries uh all around uh and uh, that they are always in contact with one another so they properly guard the perimeter there and uh they're not going to be easily taken by surprise definitely and uh they as we've seen, the fact that they're all mounted in general provides with a better capacity. Of, whereas, I don't know, a Roman army at this point was full of infantrymen. They couldn't run away simply on horseback, right? So, also, think about the wagons, the cars, you know, how they, they were simply functionalized to live on the move as nomads. The source says, in combat, they do not, as do the Romans and Persians, form their battle line in three parts, but in several units of irregular size, all join closely together to give the appearance of one long battle line. So this is very interesting because it reveals also the the simplicity, the degree of simplicity of uh, military, of tactical 
you know, logic. It fits with their own idea of, of equality of the various clans, right? You have a single battle line and the clans are disposed all in a row, right? Uh, it's a simple, effective formation and we'll see how they functionalize it, uh, tactically speaking. Um, the source says, separate from their main formation, they have an additional force which they can send out to ambush a careless adversary or, hold, or holding reserve to aid a hard-pressed section. Right? Um, they, yeah, they use reserves as, as well, and the the the, the function is uh, standard here. They they realize where this, the the section of the line where they're suffering the most is sending reinforcement in to fill in the gaps. They keep their spare horses close behind their main line and their baggage train to the right or left of the line, about a mile or two away, under a moderately sized guard. Um, this is interesting, you don't find it so often, but the concept may be that if the enemy wants to loot the camp, they have at least to expose their flanks to the line at some level, because they have to, to enact diver diversionary movements that exposes their flanks altogether. Um, and um, yeah, um, and also here it distinguishes the spare horses from the baggage train, right? Um, here at least there is a comment that says "and" behind, it says behind the main line for the spare horses, and uh, you know, right or left of the line, about one or two miles uh, for for the uh, for the baggage train. Um, so spare horses at that point may have technically a tactical function that he's, you know, some skilled and imagine even the, the, these people sort of fight prevalently against each other like any other. So they, um, you know, all that horse archery brings unavoidably horses to die a lot, to be worn out also for the same fatigue, right? You know, this very quick um, hit and run tactics require different mounts, fresh mounts for protracting the, the clash. And there is not just horse archers, by the way, there are also heavy cavalry that are always there waiting to properly launch the attack at the moment in which the enemy is at, is, is at its weakest. Uh, also in proportion to your own strength, by the way, because that, that's always the, the thing. Um, the source goes on and says, frequently they tie the extra horses together to the rear of their battle line as a form of protection. Hmm? Frequently, so not always. So these extra horses can also be tied together as a sort of line of protection. Uh, I don't know how you see this, right? Because these are horsemen. Apparently, they they fight uh, on on horseback. You think all the time. We have seen something uh, similar for the Berbers at the Battle of Mammes uh, around the same time. The the strategicon was written where properly uh, Berbers started shooting from. They had made a circle of, of camels. And, and as a as literally a place to fall back on as a last line as a last resort, and um, shooting from below their their animals' bellies as a as a cover, um, might this be the same for these people? Who knows, right? I don't see that <laughs> very much, but it may be, right? At least we have to think that different uh, that similar solutions were used and asked by by different peoples at the same time. So why not? Um, then the source says they make the depth of their files indefinite depending on the circumstances being inclined to make them deeper and they make their front even and dense. This is particularly interesting for one reason because um, there is a tendency properly to uh, deepen the, uh, the, the formation. right? So this goes naturally at expense of the, uh, the width, the, the breadth of the same. Uh, what does this mean exactly? Right, in, in my opinion, this simply means that they were uh, doing this, and you know, probably lines were not dramatically deep altogether. But fundamentally, for having a you know decent uh, range of uh, you know, of, let's say a, a decent level of concentrated fire, right in, in the front. That is to say, the more ho archers you put in the rear, the, the more they can't shoot. Yes, the fact that they are, you know, rare, in the back, they, yeah, you, you, you lose some, uh, some tens of meters, probably, uh, of range altogether, but this fundamentally manages to make you concentrate fire like hell, right, per, mm, mm, 
breadth of the front, right? Uh, meter, uh, whatever. And and this might have properly been purposeful to stop against heavier formations such as the Roman one, also, also the um, the unavoidable that is given that most of their cavalry was light, and they they would give way to heavier units, right? So they they were here precisely capable of simply avoiding hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? Because they would have had the worst of it. And still, you know, we know perfectly that these people's tactics were about going back and forth like that, right? Then they would l themselves being chased, and but eventually they they would have they would be quicker and more than their adversaries. Uh, this would happen sometimes with entire divisions. So it's not really that it happened just back and forth at small uh, unit tactics level. Um, but still, um, this the, the idea is that if you need to open your formation because the enemy is chasing you, still you lose the possibility of, con of concentrating your forces more effectively against him. Right, so as we've seen, archery is mostly what they had, and therefore, if you narrow the front, you can concentrate fire altogether in that right per meter. The 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 alternative, and so this is a tendency that they seemingly favorably did. Right, the the alternative is widening the front, then naturally exposes the enemy to to outflank maneuvers, etc. Um, so it depends on how the uh, the situation is is, fun. but. You say flanking maneuvers are good when you can eventually smash with also some, somebody that fights from you know let's say the front and the flank. Uh, when you have permanently a horse archer ar army and a few heavy uh, elite, well that thing is you know outflanking the enemy at that point is uh, unless you have an overwhelming numerical superiority, s probably not so convenient. It's better for your units to remain in that line and to just withdraw going back and forth like that and concentrate its fire still in front to inflict the enemy lots of, m more losses right in a shorter amount of time because the the broader you are the more you dilute uh, the fire uh, the, the more you you extend the front but the more you dilute the, the same fire as we've seen on the same people and as we've seen that's not even a ma much a matter of physical damage properly of you know moral devastating thing that is you know the enemy doesn't know how many arrows you have left Right, and usually these guys had enough to fight an entire day. So uh, that intensity per time um, and space can be devastating from a psychological point of view against, you know, even much heavier opponents. So this might have been the, the prevailing, and uh, for for such preference, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting, actually. Um, and and still. Yeah, even if you had eventually wanted to flank the enemy, let's say that these uh, horse archers were surely capable from from the sides to to depart and to start extending uh, the flanks, right? So it's probably not so uh, you know compromising. Let's say it would be much more difficult to do that with an infantry army in general. Uh, it's that these horse archers could do it much more easily by themselves. We've seen the pr basically all they did were quite mobile, so that was still always an option, but the important here was also causing enough damage to the enemy front. Then the source says, they prefer battles fought at long range, ambushes, encircling their ad adversaries, simulated retreats and sudden returns, and wedge-shaped formation cities in scattered groups. So here, as we've seen, here we've just said that they tended to make a single line and to, to, to make it dance. And then the source says, you know, but also they prefer battles for the long range ambushes encircling their adversaries, simulated retreats and sudden returns, wet shaped formations of these scattered groups. That is to say, a bit the opposite, right? So obviously, uh, we have to think in, in this regard that the first part is mostly referred to pitch battles, right? And the second is what these people did, even in proximity uh, of pitch battles in the previous days, right? We have seen it. Uh, very good examples of the Turks at Battle Manzikert. We made a uh, two hours and a half video about that. You know, uh, the the main deal there is tactical as strategical actually, because you j normally m the the bulk of their especially shock forces would be far behind, right? As a reserve, nobody would properly know. As we've seen, they they could mostly 
They were very mobile, so the battlefields were extended, sometimes for kilometers. It's difficult for the enemy, maybe days before battle, to properly understand what's going on. Because every day there would be these horse archers that attack you and harass you. You don't understand whether it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the main attack or if there's just, uh, in fact, an ambush, an attempt. And actually, it, it can turn for, the same, for these same peoples uh, differently, given the opportunity. Like if they say, maybe they don't plan the big attack at that point, but if the enemy gives way and there is a possibility of chasing that, they, they will send more troops. Um, so it's all like a back and forth, and that's mostly the psychological element that puzzles the enemy at that point. What the hell are these guys doing, right? How many more are they of this? Why do they never stop firing? Where does the main attack come, right? This is what their enemies think. And and the the the, the interesting thing is that these guys were used to do this at each other all the time in step. So um, it would be, you see, dramatically easy. As for other things, as we'll see in the pursuit, uh, to, to enact these tactics against more, um, let's say, more stationary uh, armies, such as the Roman ones in this case, right? Okay, they would be, you know, uh, a tougher nut to crack, given that the, these sedentary armies are also better protected there. You can't just wipe them out with arrows. You need a, a decent shock force eventually to complete the job, and that's where things balance themselves out at that point. But still, right, for them, it's an easy, it's just, just shooting turkey, right? You know, in, in uh, especially when there is a thickly compact mass, you can't, you don't even need to aim properly, right, at, at it. You just make hails of arrows raining, Salvas, uh, you know, volleys at every freaking time, uh, one after the other, and you know you're gonna hit and uh, and properly causing that the damage, that the disorder that you wish for. The source says when they make their enemies take to flight, they put everything else aside and are not content as the Persians, the Romans, and other peoples with pursuing them a reasonable distance and plundering their goods. But they do not let up at all until they have achieved the complete destruction of their enemies, and they employ every means to this end. Right? This is particularly important because it's also something that these people probably were awaiting always for in their own reality. You see, in their own reality, you, you can't really chase anybody because they, they, they mount... Uh, you know, fast horses are as yours. When you have prevalently foot armies, uh, the, the sedentary populations, when they flee, <laughs> you, 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 you take them down, right? You chop them down, you, it's so easy, right? And you can't catch, because these guys go for the loot, remember? So it's not just about the, um, you know, the, 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 the camp that at that point is going to be easily looted. These guys want to to really kill everybody and to make the the, the which is in the step it's a dream, because it's very hard to kill everybody when you have an, uh, a mounted army that flees and it's always, as we've seen, scattered. And so think about the satisfaction any time they they manage to defeat somebody that was mostly on foot. How to to to, to take them down one by one, right? To chase them there, and they had definitely the best cavalrys for this, given that. You know, properly, uh, peoples from from these cult from this ethnic background were regularly used all over. Uh, you know, for example, medieval history and beyond for carrying out these specific tasks. Right, medieval armies in I don't know in Hungary, for example, they would always use these peoples of the steps to 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 raid to to lay waste the camp before the main army passed because that's what they were there for for the loot. That's how also they were paid, by the way. They contented with themselves with few. They would purchase the the enemies. They, they couldn't mostly... These were light cavalry. They mostly couldn't hold their own ground, right? But still, they, they could pursue the enemy when the heavier cavalry was, was exhausted, right? And like locusts, because there were so many. So they were pervasive. They were best for, for, for hunting down the enemy. Then the source says, if some of the enemy they are pursuing take refuge in a fortress, they make continual and thorough force to discover any shortage of necessities for horses or men. They then wear their enemies down by such shortages and get them to accept terms favorable to themselves. 
right? Their first demands are fairly light, and when the enemy has agreed to these, they impose stricter terms. So I really want to squeeze out any resource from the enemy. They're very clever at also spotting, think about the knowledge properly of terrain. Like, these peoples live uh, in, in basically in a never-ending plane. Right, so they all well, all they see is the sky and earth, right? And they they know how to to orientate themselves on them properly, spotting the terrains, um, the, the 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 their characteristics, etc. Much better than what the average you know um, person in a sedentary world, you know, it, not even a yeah, even in a more civilized world can do. Right, they know things properly. Others don't. They they properly have also a physical exercise that enables them to to reach uh, uh, on horseback or on foot certain areas that most people say it's insane. Right, because they're they're savage from the man. They're wild. They 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 have a you know really a, a hell of a of a of intelligence in that sense of a physique. Um, and th that's what they live for all, all this, like every day, time by time. Um, they also can hold out longer. Like imagine in these situations, uh, right? Even physical, they, these are very resilient. They are not scared to wait more than others, even when they are deprived of resources more than others. Consider that, right? For a general levy of a sedentarized reality, yes, they may be mostly agricultural, they are also tough living in farms, etc. But it's never as much as you know living literally on horseback your entire life in terms of physical resilience. They probably lived also shortly, right? Uh, life of these people was miserable, miserable, brutal, and short fundamentally. Uh, but exactly for that, they gave a less, <laughs> you know, damn about, you know, consequence. They, they they would like to cash immediately and know how to find the way to the best way to do it. Um, still, however, logistics. Uh, the strategicon says they are hurt by a shortage of fodder, which can result from the huge number of horses they bring with them. So their entire military machine, as we've seen, relies on the logistical problems of you know how how to feed their 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 animals. So also in the event of battle, when opposed by an infantry force in close formation, they stay on their horses and do not dismount. Uh, why would they? Right. Also, for they do not last long fighting on foot. In fact, um, and they have been brought up properly on horseback and owing to their lack of exercise they simply cannot walk about on their own feet well this is an exaggeration also because in order to go on horseback you you must have such you know trained muscular legs that never end uh consider that these guys are the ones credited of having brought the stirrup to to europe um which in fact yeah, it's much more likely than the Eastern connection via the middle via Persia. Um, and uh, so they are the ones that properly have introduced that because they have more strains to their legs. They need that they, they see more impact. They see more properly, you know, force on horseback being constantly, uh, you know, released uh, through to, to their legs, etc. So it's it's very intense and they can of course walk uh, but here the strategician says something silly but still very intelligent because of course these guys are literally brought up on horseback these guys are all one with their horses they they leave there they eat they, they like they don't see properly another way of living the freeman is is a horseman and he and always lives on horseback because that's what uh, you know these people are always on the run they don't have time to lose right um, the source says level unobstructed ground should be chosen and a cavalry force should advance against them in a dense unbroken mass to engage them in hand to hand fighting right so you uh, start the uh, properly the advice again to operate against them um, naturally given the nature of mostly uh, light cavalry when they, if you have to attack them and hoping and don't think here Okay, we can digress a little, but you know they, they will obviously give way to to a to heavy cavalry in you know, a thickly compact mass can at least disperse them. This, as we've seen, balances itself out because these guys can open a you know can retreat and still shooting the, the famous uh, part in shot back shot even when running away. So 
there is never an easy, you know, predictable way of how to defeat them, like in any army, in any in any military context. Um, but at least they 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 will tend to 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 suffer of that confrontation at least as a as a mass on their own. They will at least retreat or open up or whatever. They don't want to engage in hand hand fighting because they are unarmored. Whereas at least you know the average Byzantine cavalryman, at least you know the, properly the Roman one, not these other guys that is flocked. We made a video on this about mercenaries um, in Byz early Byzantine armies. Uh, and these were the most common, by the way, the scutai, right, as they were called. Um, they um, they would be heavier regularly, right? So as we've seen, these guys have no interest in closing in, right? Just their elite does because it's armored for that purpose. But it's a qualitative, but also numerical elite, and, and often it, alone, it's not necessarily capable of, of making it against uh, this broader masses of enemies that are less armored so yes they will suffer but still you know if you find a determining infantry or you know some kind of combined tax and effective army uh, you may never know right so uh, then the source says night attacks are also effective with part of our force maintaining its formation while the other lies in ambush mm -hmm. so you can trick them out like that, but as we've seen, they're not easy to be caught by surprise. They are seriously hurt by defections and desertions. So as we were saying before, all these clans and tribes operate fundamentally uh, in an autonomous way. So it's easy, even during the battle, seeing the entire chunks of the army, you know, going away or simply not giving a damn about orders. Right, this is typical. Even when they operated in as mercenaries in, in other armies, everybody knew that these guys, once you... Once they exhausted their arrows and, uh, you know, hopefully put the, their enemy in, in flight, they, they would simply run away looking for the camp and loot. And you couldn't simply call them uh, off, like, at that point, they, they were gone, right? And this would be true of this lack of broader discipline uh, in this, um, alongside the main chunks of the, the formation, probably a problem within themselves, too. Um, and um, so... In general, also, their logistical capabilities, as, as we've seen, were a serious problem because you, uh, they, you know, if they, they had problems of remaining too long in a single place because of the pasture of their horses. They, if, if the grass was exhausted, if it was a place with a few water, etc., uh, they would naturally avoid to go there, but still... Uh, they had some limited time uh, operationally. That, that is to say, also other armies had, but these had a greater one proportionally because of the number of horses, uh, the ratio of horses on a regular base. Uh, then, so you see how the tactical um, uh, yeah, and strategical elements balance themselves out, right? You know, you never have, like, the, the army that is absolutely better than another you already know, but also because they would have not fought anyway, because what you fight to lose, right? So, but air advantage is has a disadvantage at the same time and every situation is different and you have to stay aware at least of the main characteristics of these people the source says they are f very fickle avaricious and composed of so many tribes as they are they have no sense of kinship or unity with one another if a few begin to desert and are all well received many more will follow this is more of a political than a strategical note but um, as we were saying before, uh, they have, s says, you say, these peoples are in, uh, under monarchies. You see, these texts are not very coherent, but they had just said they have monarchic organization, yes. But here it says then they have no sense of kinship or unity w with one another as well. So it's easy to produce pertur political perturbations, like if you pay them some money, right? You can't you know, create some instability within the, the political balance between these peoples, maybe they will start quarreling, etc., because the more money you, you... You see, this is how the thing went immediately. There was a leader managed to score a victory, collect enough loot. Immediately, there would be lots of these guys that, that joined him from other peoples that at that point were, had, were even as poorer than this guy had become. So the more successful this guy, the richer and more powerful, then eventually maybe this guy died, and maybe a great part of it's... Uh, of of these you know uh, confederacy capacity was based on the leadership of that man, um, 
there were quarrels between the, the families, the clans, the, you know, everything. This thing split again, right? So think that this people were were peoples were a nightmare. Also, like in terms of international, you know, strategical analysis prediction. That used to say, what what the hell are they doing? Like think even about properly the level of information. I don't know how much literature exists, right? Because these peoples were mostly like they they were not literate. So even embassies, things like that, they are not present, like we don't know much, but think about all the interpreters, all the informers, etc. There was surely somebody in Constantinople that dealt with these things uh, in a specialized sense, like the specialist of the Turks, because they had to know what the hell they had in mind all the time. And the source goes on and says, when they are moving up for battle, the first thing to do is have your scouts on the alert. A bit like them, right? So it's interesting how the thing mirrors it, even for you know the peoples they are fighting against, because it's, they're functionalized to, to fight against similar. So station at regular intervals. Remember, it's the same thing they do themselves. They have uh, sent, sentries all around that are in contact with each other. So the the purpose here is that uh, your ones should be at regu regular intervals, so that uh, at least no major enemy unit can pass through. Right, and you you are still on the alert on what they are doing, so that you have enough time to mobilitate before these guys, um, uh, you know, out time you, right? Then, so these are all the uh, this is all the advice. Then, then make your plans and actual preparations in case the battle should not turn out well. And if you remember what was said about what these guys do during the pursuit, and also when you know somebody entrenches himself into a fortress, they, they tend to cut a, out any supply around, etc. That tells you the reason. Uh, look for a good defensive position for use in an emergency. Collect whatever provisions are available. Right. Remember, you have to out uh, resource them. Right, if you if you chose a good place to retreat on a series of fortresses in a high ground, you have stock there, enough provisions. Maybe, you know, you can't hold out for for long enough for these guys to go away, right? Because they need uh, also as we've seen this grazing grounds, etc. So uh, enough for a few days, it says, for the horses as well as for the men, mm -hmm. because you may need you may need all, especially have plenty of water. As always, water being the most single most important thing that exhausts itself more quickly. And it's also more complex to, you know, especially if you can't access even an open, if you're entrenched in a fortress, like uh, you must have a, a well or some, you know, barrels, whatever, things like these, because, you know, maybe there is a, just a stream outside, but it's, it's hide outside, and these are where, where you're hiding from. Those guys that are just out there, and they're expert in cutting you out from there. So that's very important. You, you, which is frightening if you think about this, because it is a strategical advice for an imperial military. It says you should freak out every time you 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 fight against these guys. You have to think very well, also of predisposing things for for a defeat in the first place. With psychologically, it's right. Uh, you know, you don't start from the <laughs> from a positive mindset, but rightfully so. And then make arrangements for the baggage train, as explained in the book treating of that subject. Now, I've gone read at this. It's, it says simply that basically during the march you have to keep your uh, baggage in the rear, well guarded, and when the enemy is inside, you know, during battle you have basically to surround it with your troops, right? It has to say the cent center of the formation. So predictably, um, it was about uh, avoiding this camp to the, the, your baggage and everything to fall prey of these raiders that can't come from everywhere during the battle as we've seen as they disperse themselves and they are just there in for the loot um, then if an infantry force is present it should be stationed in the front line in the customary manner of the nation to which it belongs this is another predisposition, as we've seen in the 6th century. The Romans had plenty of uh, of auxiliaries of, of foreigners, sometimes were the same people. Um, and the idea is that infantry should withstand the onslaught of these guys, because at the end of the day, they're more expandable, and as uh, hopefully uh, heavy uh, infantry, they're still you know basically the best option against against light cavalry and as we've seen the enemy has no intention of closing in with most of its forces just harassing you with constant arrow fire so these guys are going to absorb the, the hit the shot. and the reason why 
um, cavalry should stay in the uh, okay. If the infantry is forced to station in front line, the customary manner of the nation which belongs, yes. And um, yeah, so these guys are basically a screen, right? And they have to be connected with the rest of their ethnic contingent because that naturally strengthens cohesion and they can be supported also by cavalry when things go wrong. If they, the enemy needs to, to break through because also they will close in, they will get into hand-to-hand -hand combat if the, the line wavers and that's what they're waiting for. Um, then uh, it says the force should, so the Roman force should be drawn up according to the method shown in the diagram of the complex line of battle that is with the cavalry posted behind the infantry. So uh, this is literally a diagram that is in the strategicon. Here I don't put it to you, but it's very simple, right? It's like a horseshoe, right? Imagine the opening is in the rear, so in the, in the front you have this, uh, in fact, convex line of battle, and the basically the best troops like are the the outer layer, it's infantry. It's basically all infantry, and the horseshoe is literally made of infantry, right? And the the internal line of the horseshoe is also composed of archers that provide shooting over the heads of their uh, comrades, uh, this extra support is very good against, as you understand, also against horse archery because uh, that's as we will see what they f actually horse archers fear the most, right? The, uh, the because they they can out normally they are they're out uh, out range or also at least they have less accuracy than I infantry archers, and cavalry basically your own cavalry stationed at the bottom end of of the two um, you know b bottom ends of of the horseshoe. Right, just behind that. So they're basically protected by the same infantry by a certain degree, but they can move easily on the flanks and attack in the enemy, right? That. Um, and that's basically the diagram. It's that simple, but it does make sense after all, because it protects cavalry um, that is very vulnerable to, to arrow fire, as, and as we've seen, these people basically are specialized at taking down their own their own cavalry because they, that's all they see um, and uh, still you know it, it's solid enough with infantry in, uh, outside and um, and um, and archers on the on the in the internal one um, it's also um, yeah it, it, it's not like a single line you see so it, it's fundamentally uh, designed properly to Maybe yes, you would get more fire concentrated at the uh, in the front of the horseshoe, but at the same time, um, other units will be fresher in the rear, uh, and cavalry can still fundamentally move on the flanks and maybe uh, cutting properly the enemy retreat if in case the the frontal part of the the, the formation opens or something like that, and the enemy pours in. So yeah, it's uh, or maybe cavalry can simply pass in internally, right, that it's seducing as an ID as well, but let's not make it too complicated. Um, simply, yeah, this is a tactic definitely designed to maintain a, you know, a, 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 a fundamentally a defensive one, as you understand, because cavalry is, is, is in reserve, right, infantry is just there, as we've seen, as an anvil to take all these missile fire. And uh, and then the source says, if only the cavalry is ready for combat, draw them up according to the manner set down in books of, of, on, uh, on, on formations. Post a numerous and capable force on the flanks. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the rear, the defenders are sufficient. So here, yeah, fundamentally, he's telling that you need some kind of mobility also on, on the on the sides on the flanks to maybe you know. Uh, maybe uh, encircle the uh, an eventual breakthrough. The uh, defenders, the defensores, are basically uh, that cavalry that should stay in reserve while the uh, cursores, the, the assaulters, um, the attackers, as here it's called in translation in English, um, uh, are, are battling in front of the line. So to follow up, like a uh, fresh reserve and to overrun a scattered enemy, the interior should have been softened up enough by the, the attackers. Um, so the important here is to still maintain a maneuverable formation that can't probably shoot these guys from, from some some area, from, from some, at least some side. And uh, consider that, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the flanks are vulnerable altogether to, I mean, in the corners proper. So... The enemy 
as we've seen, has mostly a, fr a frontal, like, will will attack frontally, but still, also the best way to target an, uh, you is, is from the flanks. So they will try to encircle you in a way or another uh, with some unit and uh, exercising some more pressure on the flanks. The same flanks can be properly, you know, um, you know, um, uh, as we've seen, the 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 uh, this force on the flanks is needed to broaden the, the the front in a sense, and also to avoid your the bulk of your forces in the sense to be exposed to flank attack directly at least. So naturally, this comes at a cost because you have to uh, have to, to broaden the front and to reduce depth. So this all depends on the circumstance. But um, here, the source says that normally. You know this depth of the, of the, the normal two thirds of the of a regular unit cavalry unit here of uh, uh, of the uh, are, are that are the defenders are sufficient as a reserve fundamentally, and that you shouldn't worry too much about the frontal breaking capacity of these guys after all, but rather properly of the uh, of, of flank in one. Um, then it says when pursuing the assault troops so the one third of the attack the, the, the cursores should not get more than three or four bow shots away from the formations of the defensores this is very interesting because uh, it really tells you how dangerous it is for this minority, minority part of the, of the line to venture ahead when the, those guys are out there because they, they could ambush them and you know, three or four bow shots are not that far away. It's still in sight. It's fundamentally, um, it's not even the distance which lines are normally deployed, the battle lines. You know? So, um, it's really uh, a tremendous risk, even at close distance, to to go out of formation under this enemy's fire. Nor should they become carried away in the charge, right? Because the cursors technically are all about that. So even just by vocation. And uh, in, in this against this enemy, they have to be very careful because those guys are not waiting. <laughs> but uh, for you to charge and to to wear you out in the process, to, for you not to be able to come back alive. Um, then it says, when possible, seek a clear and unobstructed area to form the battle line, where no woods, marshes, or hollows might serve as a screen for the enemy for enemy ambushes. Um, Yes, and uh, because these guys are capable eventually of doing it, even though you could argue that for them it's better to to remain in open light. It depends, like on what you. Of course, if you are if you are defending, uh, this is less true. But hopefully, in, in the event of a pursuit, like those guys are normally exploiting such um, such uh, terrain features to properly. Uh, uh, so to to hide their forces and to maybe to reverse the the battle outcome when you're pursuing the enemy, you think you have defeated them all, and you break a formation and uh, you, you know, and they they attack you and you're done for. Even when they, they are just a few amount of troops, if they still maintain cohesion, they have an advantage over a uh, dissolved uh, unit. So the dissolved formation. Then post scouts at some distance from all four sides of the formation. So this amplifies your range of uh, properly of awareness of the battlefield from from all directions because the enemy can literally come from any direction, even from your rear that you didn't notice. So this allows you to be more, you know, capable of uh, reaction against them if they they pop out. And if at all possible, it is helpful to have an affordable river, marshes, or, or lake behind the battle line, you see, so that the rear is securely defended. So these guys have to come just at the, uh, from the, at the front. That can be a harsh thing, but they no, they're normally not able to break by themselves. They may harass it, they may cause also important losses, but still, um, it's still better than being outflanked. Right, which we'll try to do. Uh, if the battle turns out well, do not be hasty in pursuing the enemy or behave carelessly. This is typical also for other enemies, but in these in particular, because you may never know how, whether they regroup, they're scattered, they 
Um, they're difficult. They, they're fast. They move fast. They can't come back more easily than others. But even when they break the formation, they can recompose it more easily. For this nation does not, as do the others, give up the struggle when war set in the first battle. Right? They are habituated to this back and forth, and there is no concrete way to know when they, they have finally retreated. So there is always this risk out there. Um, but until the strength, their strength gives out, the source says, they try all sorts of ways to assail their enemies. If their formation is mixed, with most of it being infantry, it's still necessary to make provision for forage for the horses. When the enemy is approaching, by no means should the cavalry be allowed to send out foraging parties. That is to say, basically, watch your cavalry. Because uh, foraging parties are naturally going to be easy prey, to fall easy prey of these guys. Um, and uh, horses may have to be kept in reserve for a long time, even during the battle. It may last days, right? So... Um, make provision for the forage for the horses because it may stay out there for a long time before being able to counterattack um, and also simply guard it well because those guys are as we've seen can raid your camp easily and they're gonna aim at it and basically let the infantry when you the majority of it especially of your armies made of it uh, to in order to screen these guy uh, this guy's attack because that's fundamentally uh, yes. They you, you already know that you're going to take losses, right? But if they they can't do anything uh, about you know the, the the solidity of your formation, you 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 have the advantage over it. And there's still a, you see there's enemies is particularly frustrating because um, this is the end of the text by the way um, because you can never fully uh, manage to. Uh, to to even know what what's going on, right? At some point, it, it's properly difficult in battles to say. After a day, you see, it says, "Don't don't remain careful because these guys can uh, during the night maybe counterattack doing these things uh, as the, also other armies can do." But with these ones, maybe even after days, you have not a clear idea unless you you don't they don't properly left something behind some baggage, etc., to the flat. Uh, but not even at that point you should be totally comfortable with it, because they may come back. They, they have just a greater capacity of staying out in the wild and regrouping quickly and covering uh, large distances, and therefore you're, you're always at risk. And you may not accomplish, even in this regard, any decisive uh, victory, but maybe not even they can, right? So... It's it's uh, it's a it's an attrition warfare at the end of the day. If you don't break, it, as we've seen, it's mostly psychological. They want you to break. You, they want you and under with adrenaline, under pressure, you you are tending to do that. You want to do that because you want to get out of that freaking mess, right? But it, that's exactly what they want you to do. Their world warfare is designed to harass you in that way, to 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 make you react. Uh, but if they uh, if you remain at your post. You have significant chances of 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 you know uh, achieving a victory, and yes, you may have taken your losses, but they they may have not broken through, and that means maybe you know you have prevented them successfully from raiding a province of, of the empire, and uh, they may not can come back uh, at least particularly soon, and, and or uh, you know at the end of the day they may have suffered their losses as well and as we've seen if we speak just of of archery we don't even have to over overstate properly the the material damage and the physical damage brought by them right especially a byzantine army would have a its infantry with its infantry cavalry or armor so would, would in would, would successfully parry these this this missile right most of them would not cause significant damage um, and therefore, it's just the effect, right? These people here it doesn't say it, but you know they had other psychological ways, certain howling, uh, certain um, you know songs, certain noises, certain with the drums, for example. That they 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 wanted to make uh, the the psychophysical experience here ter terrifying, right? But at the end of the day, they didn't have that. Um, Enormous much, at least until they, they resorted properly to combined tactics. Here it doesn't, um, that is to say, until they 
they, they didn't wear you out completely to be properly invested by the elite cavalry. Um, so these guys were actually a great pain in behind. It, it, it doesn't properly this passage both for uh, um, strategic and times and the, ta the tactic as once later on are not the full depiction of what ours and Magyars respectively were capable of. But tendentially, right, these people, also of the steps, etc., were fighting this way, right? And their warfare was gradu would gradually change. It's like when Leo talks about the Bulgars that had somewhat Christianized and Romanized, and therefore so they fought in a more similar way to the Byzantines. Um, yeah, um, but more or less, like the importance of cavalry and also the possibility of these peoples to properly call other tribes from the steppe, etc., to serve, because as we've seen, they would join from from far away when there was possibility of looting, was a concrete possibility, right? Especially when, you know, the, the this threat was so close. Like, in fact, the Magyars, the Magyars and the Avars were, uh, after all, just from the other side of the of the Danubian frontier, so uh, they were close. They could raid uh, in an area that, in fact, historically, you know, had been somewhat developed. Like, think about Moesia. It was a rich place where that, you know, during the Middle Ages it became ever more a frontier area. Right, uh, whereas you know that was properly left behind, even by the same Byzantines, because they said, you know, what what do we defend it for? So all, all along the lines to cost it. Like, let's assume a, you know, broader defense in depth, or at least let's accentuate it, so that at least you know these guys have to enter hundreds of kilometers of imperial territory, being, you know, uh, you know, coming far from their lines of supplies and we can't strike them more easily if we leave this land not particularly cold. It's not in the entire story because there are very important centers there in the Danubian con frontier such as Sirmium that in fact was battled over by uh, the uh, the Vavars, the, the, the Byzantines and whoever was there actually. But in general, right, the Danubian Valley was also invested regularly by these uh, waves of nomadic populations. Every once in a while they, they would and uh, so it's a bit of it's a fascinating region to study, and we will do it hopefully in the uh, in other videos. But um, for now, I would say we don't we stop it here because there is not really enough to to you know so much to add. Right? This is fundamentally what the Romans thought of these peoples and how they told you essentially here how they had to cope with them from a Roman perspective. We will make videos naturally on Byzantine army, on uh, all these other people, so we were saying before, and so long for that point. And for now, we'll just stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.